Number 3. Robert Perry and Matthew Henson These two men established a great friendship later in their life, but they had total opposite upbringings. Robert Perry was born on May 1856 in Pennsylvania. He grew up in a middle-class household and later completed an engineering degree. In his 20s, he was fascinated on exploring uncharted territories and decided to be a mariner. On the other hand, Matthew Henson was born on August 1866 in Maryland. At the age of 12, he found work as a cabin boy after he begged the ship's captain to hire him. He cleaned floors, moved food inventories, and organized ship supplies. During his time aboard, he traveled to various countries and different continents and experienced different parts of the world. After working there for many years, he moved up in rank, and the captain took Matthew under his wings and taught him about sea navigation. Eventually, he became a permanent crew member. But this all came to an end in 1884, when the captain passed away and the ship was sold off. Matthew moved to Washington, D.C. and worked as a clerk in a clothing store. This is where the two crossed paths. In 1887, 31-year-old Robert met 21-year-old Matthew at the store while shopping. They exchanged stories and Robert was so impressed by his navigation experience he hired him to join his team for future expeditions. For the next 20 years, they traveled in numerous countries to survey its landscape, and although they achieved much success on their ventures, they had one ambitious goal, and that is to reach the North Pole. They made two attempts in 1898 and 1905. The first trip was a failure because the ship they were on had serious damage and was forced to turn back. On their second trip, they made some progress, but halfway through the journey, they encountered terrible weather conditions and decided to abort the mission. Finally, it took them another three years, in March 1, 1909, to make their third attempt. Their ship departure from Greenland to the pole with a group of 40 Inuit people to guide them in the snowy terrain. They also brought 200 dog sleds to carry travel equipment as well as food supplies. This time, the weather was not as severe as the previous two attempts, so they decided to push forward. Three-fourths of their journey, however, a sudden snowfall occurred, which led Robert to insist most members of the group to turn back. But him, Matthew, and four other Inuit men continued their trip along with the few dog sleds. They've endured the extreme temperature, but it eventually took a toll on Robert's health as he caught a severe cold. They placed him beside the bag supplies to get carried by the dog sleds. Since this slowed the whole group down, Matthew and two other Inuit men went 10 minutes ahead of them while the other two looked out for Robert. On April 6th, after weeks of travel, Matthew and the two Inuit men claimed to have reached the North Pole and placed a flag on the spot. It took 30 minutes later until Robert arrived at the destination. The photo shows the party at what they believed to be the North Pole. Matthew was in the middle along with the four Inuit men and it was taken by Robert. The trip of returning back was less stressful for them since the weather had settled down and they eventually came home safely. They've received a huge welcome from the public because of their accomplishment and were portrayed the first ones to ever reach the North Pole. Of course, with all the media attention they received, there were some who doubted their journey. One of them was a former colleague of Robert, a guy named Frederick Cook. He was a surgeon and used to be the medical personnel on Robert's expedition in the early years. Apparently, Frederick said that he was actually the first person who reached the North Pole on April 16, 1908, just one year earlier than Robert. To prove his point, he presented the public a photo of him along with another man which he claimed to be at the North Pole. However, he didn't provide much scientific evidence apart from the photo, and many believed that he fabricated the shot. It also didn't help his case since he was known to have previously forged a photo of him on top of Mount McKinley which was widely known as the fake peak. The public overlooked Frederick's claim and adopted that Robert and his party to be the first group who reached the spot. They then received the Perry Polar Expedition Medal for their geological contribution. While Robert and Matthew received various medals from their past expeditions, this one had cemented their legacy. Although most of the 20th century widely accepted that Robert and Matthew's trip was the first to reach the North Pole, a British explorer named Wally Herbert published a book in 1989 that challenged their claim. In his book, he stated that despite the evidence provided by Robert, it was quite limited and determined that it lacks essential data. He concluded that the group didn't reach the North Pole 
and they were about 50 to 60 miles away from the exact location. While most acknowledge Wally's statement, some disregarded his work. If you wish to read Wally Herbert's book, it's called The Noose of Laurels, The Race to the North Pole. Number 2. Norwegian Explorer Ruel Admundsen. Arctic expedition was a huge deal during the early 1900s, and Roald's initial plan was to be the first one to reach the North Pole. But after he heard the news that Robert Perry and Matthew Henson had already claimed the spot, he switched plans and decided to reach the opposite side of the globe, which is the South Pole. His expedition was mainly kept secret. None of his family knew about it, nor any public announcement of his trip was made. Roald's ship arrived on an ice port of the southern part of Antarctica called Bay of Wales on January 14, 1911. He and his crew brought food, wool clothing, and dog sleds for transportation. They didn't immediately set out when their ship landed. Instead, they built a base headquarter two miles from the ship to prepare for the long trip ahead of them. Roald was well aware of the potential problems they may encounter during the trip, so they stocked up on fresh meat by hunting seals and penguins in the area and used the seal's skin to craft winter clothing. During their time on the base, they improved their tools to be more efficient. One of the members redesigned their sleds and made them 75% lighter, which was vital since it could save them a lot of strength and energy throughout the trip. It was also around this time on February 4th that a British explorer named Robert Falcon Scott and his ship crossed paths with Roald's ship on the Bay of Wales ice port. The left ship belongs to Scott's, and on the right was Roald. Scott didn't set up his camp near the Bay of Wales, but rather a few miles away from it at the Ross Island. Both had the same objective, to reach the South Pole, and this became a race between the two parties. With all the preparations completed, Roald and his three crew members set out on September 9th. The first couple of miles of the journey was a breeze, since the landscape was flat, and they mainly used the dog sleds as transportation. They rode alongside the sleds with their skis on, which proved to be an efficient way to travel and to preserve energy. However, one-third of their journey, they encountered an unforeseen severe weather condition and had to return back to their camp. On October 20th, Roald and four new crew members set out for a second attempt. The weather had calmed down, and they built small tents along their trip to rest at night. The journey this time was more successful, and although they had some mishaps along the way, they made better progress than their previous one. As expected, the group started experiencing frostbite on their faces due to the cold temperature. Worried that Scott's group reached there first, they continued to push through, and eventually on December 14th, 55 days since they had left, they reached the South Pole. The group wasted no time and immediately planted a Norwegian flag and took a photo. While it looks like a clear victory for them, the team were eager to really pinpoint the exact coordination of the South Pole so they spent an additional three days to make extensive observation to verify the coordinates. Before leaving the scene, they left a letter inside the tent stating that they were the first group to reach the South Pole. When Roald and his crew returned home safely in Norway, they instantly went to the press and surprised the public to announce their achievement. It took a few months later when Roald heard the bad news that Scott and his crew didn't survive their journey. Today, the tent Roald's group built is no longer there. It is believed that it's now buried under 100 feet of ice, and Scott's group were the last people to see it. Number 1. Scottish Explorer Joseph Thompson At a very young age, Joseph developed a great interest in geology and soon became a member of the prestigious Royal Geographical Society. In 1883, at the age of 25, he was assigned to embark on a trip to the East Central area of Africa. His mission was to find the shortest route from the East Coast to Lake Victoria in Tanzania so they could establish an efficient trade route as well as build trade agreements. But this came with two problems. First, the area he would need to pass through is the home of a fierce tribe called the Maasai. Secondly, there were already other European traders in the surrounding zone and were known to be quite aggressive to other explorers. Despite the problems he may encounter, he brought along a relatively small crew with him and armed themselves with very few weapons. Unlike others, Joseph was known to avoid confrontation. He respected the land and the people he met. In fact, his motto was, he who goes gently, goes safely. He who goes safely, goes far. During his journey, he discovered several landmarks, 
One of the famous ones is the Thompson Falls, which he named and dedicated to his father. As he mapped out the majority of Kenya and the surrounding area, he encountered the Maasai people. The first meeting was quite intense. The tribe thought that Joseph was looking to capture them to make them slaves. But Joseph did the unthinkable. He came up to them, grabbed his teeth, and removed his dentures. He held it up high to show it to them, then placed it back in his mouth. The tribe were shocked by this and thought that he was some kind of magician. But it was at this moment when both parties shared friendly laughter. The Maasai tribe welcomed Joseph and his crew members to their land, and they let them pass through without any hassle. This made Joseph's job much easier, and he eventually completed his objective. He found a shorter route and made some trade agreements in various areas in the east part of Africa. On the journey back home, he suffered from malaria and severe abdominal pain, and even got gored by a buffalo. In spite of all that, he managed to recover just in time to receive a medal awarded to him called the Founder's Gold Medal for his achievement on mapping numerous areas of Africa.